Sandbag is a player hiding a true skill now to realize an advantage later. Can a player lose games on purpose to lower a Fargo rating? The answer is a clear yes. Can sandbagging be prevented? The answer is a clear no. But you might be interested in this little study I'm about to share with you on the issue. Normally, when we dig into the Fargo Ray database, we're looking at some effect across a broad range of people. That's a transverse or cross-sectional study. What we're doing here is different. We're selecting a small number of people and following them over an extended period of time. That's a really powerful kind of study called a longitudinal study. If you were interested in studying badass drug traders, you might go to Medellin, Colombia. If you were interested in studying badass chess players, you might go to, I don't know, Moscow, Russia. What if you're interested in studying badass pool league sandbaggers. Where do you go? Well, a lot of places might claim that distinction, but Oklahoma's got to be on the list. It's a pretty frequent topic of conversation there. Now let's turn the clock back two years. It's the end of 2016. President-elect Trump is about to be inaugurated. So here's what we did. We went to the senior states people in Oklahoma, the tournament directors, people who run lots of tournaments and leagues and have their finger on the pulse of player ratings, and know what's going on in Oklahoma. And we said, who are the worst of the worst? Who are the sandbagging kingpins? There's a lot of worry about league data going into Fargo Raid. We want to know who the worst offenders are. We just want to know who they are. We're not going to do anything. We just want to know who they are. So we got a list of nine players, uh, all with established Fargo ratings. And we did nothing with it. We basically put these names in a time capsule and buried it until now. These people are like offspring between uh, Ocean's 8 and the Dirty Dozen, so we'll call them the Dirty Nine. Two years ago, they, they all had at least 200 games in the system, between 200 and 700 with an average of about 400. Now they have an average of 1,900 games in the system. And this 1,900 games is about 500 tournament games per player and 1,400 league games per player. Interesting to see how these nine players' ratings, overall ratings, have changed over the last two years with all these games added. The rating changes are a whole lot of not remarkable. They go from the dark gray ones on the left, that's from two years ago, to the light gray ones on the right, that's now. You'll see a couple of them have more or less stayed the same, a couple have fallen a little, and a couple have risen a little. Again, just no big change. So these players all have well-established ratings, but is it a problem that all this league data is in there? We particularly want to look at this dirty nine because if it's ever going to be a problem, it's going to be here. These are the worst of the worst. To identify a discrepancy as being a problem, we need some sort of yardstick to identify how big is big. One point of comparison is looking at the size of APA skill ranges. According to Dr. Dave's suggestion see here, APA 5 and APA 6, each span about 100 Fargo rating points. So a player who is a 550, mid-APA 6 range, sandbags, his or her rating down to 450, mid-APA 5, that's one full APA skill range, and I think everybody would identify that as a big deal. 550 down to 525, on the other hand, mid-APA 6 to low mid-APA 6, not as big a deal. So here's an example of what we're looking for. On the next slide, you're going to see for each player something that looks like this. On the left is going to be a rating. That's, that's what the player plays as, the rating that's based upon all of the data, league and tournament data. On the right is a rating that we can calculate now that's, that has all of the league data removed. And a problem would be like shown here, where when all of the league data is removed, the rating goes up by, let's say, 100 points, the difference between horizontal lines here. Uh, this would be a problem. And here it is. The first thing you'll notice is that the dirty nine has turned into the dirty six. That's because three of the players didn't have enough tournament games to be part of this comparison. But the fascinating thing here is, first, that there is no significant change in the rating, whether the league games are included on the left or excluded on the right. And even more fascinating, the small effect that you do see in five out of the six players is that the effect, if anything, goes in the opposite direction as to what we expected. These mega league sandbaggers actually increase their rating by adding in their league games. I've shown that even in a case where league sandbagging should be large, the effect when the rubber hits the road is small or at best underwhelming. I also started out by saying that league sandbagging can and does happen and actually can't be prevented. But that's not the whole story. There are things that help deter sandbagging. 
The first and maybe most important is players actually believing the ratings. I believe that even those people who rail against Fargo ratings on Facebook actually believe them and they know other people believe them. The second is rating increases not being detached from rewards. So if you have a situation where you get rewarded for winning games, but your rating change can depend upon other details such as how many innings you took to win, to win the game, that's the recipe for a problem. Third is that, at least in principle, all of your play can contribute to a rating. So you don't have a separate rating for the such and such league that you play on Thursday night or the Saturday tournaments. Here's another thing we notice. Lots of people contact us to see whether particular matches or tournaments have been included. It's never anyone who went to and out trying to figure out if the, if the data is going in. It's always players who did well. We believe this is a consequence of people believing in the ratings, and we believe every 490 wants to be a 500 and every 590 wants to be a 600. There are exceptions to this, of course, but I think they're rare. Why does sandbagging seem so rampant? People talk about it all the time. Half of it is just lies. Next time you see the person miss a shot or lose a game and say, oh, it's just managing my rating, think of the kid who failed to make the JV football team and later claims he doesn't really like football and so he wasn't really trying. Also, the intentional losses, when they do happen, tend to be noticed. People talk about them. If I, on eight separate occasions, lose a game, obviously intentionally, uh, think about it. Four of those games I probably would have lost anyway, so there's only a swing of maybe four games, and it just doesn't have that big an impact, but there's a lot of talk about them. Finally, as players realize it doesn't have that much of an impact, they just don't do it as much. We've investigated many claims of supposed sandbagging in leagues or tournaments, and just like claims of seeing Sasquatch or ghosts or monsters under the bed or flying saucers, the eye of analysis shows that these claims are nonsense most of the time.